All right, so this is Math 372, the last of the perfect lectures, lecture 28, complex analysis. Oh, well, I, I really do not think we will reach another perfect number this semester. So what I want to do today is I want to start talking about applications of complex analysis to probability. So we've already done a little bit of this in terms of looking at the Gaussian, which is one of the most important distributions. When I teach probability, I'm normally stuck because I want to use some results from complex analysis, and normally the students don't have it. One year, I actually just took a week off in probability and did complex analysis in a week, which worked OK, but not great. What I want to do is I want to give you a sense of why you need these advanced results from analysis to finish the proof of the central limit theorem. So of course, to prove the central limit theorem, we need to at least you know, establish the framework. So probability review. OK, so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at, for the most part, nice situations. We're not going to look at the most general cases possible. And so what we'll say is x is a random variable with density f of x. Sometimes you'll just write f, but I like to put the x when we have more than one random variable in place. So you can look down and see what's going on if the following is true. 1, f of x is non-negative. 2, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of fx dx equals 1. And 3, the probability that x is in an interval a, b is just the integral from a to b of the density. And so if you've never seen integrals giving you probabilities, your calculus teacher may be shot is too strong of a word, but should at least be summoned to a court. All right. Why do we care about finding integrals? Well, one of the biggest applications of integrals is to calculating probabilities. Now, you could, of course, have more general probability distributions than this. You can have probability distributions that are supported just at the integers. You can have probability distributions that are supported some places over a continuum and other places just at discrete. We're not going to, for the most part, look at too many mixed things. I want to assume my densities are always nice. You know, I'm not going to go for the most general case. The other issue is always, which sets can you assign measures to? <coughs> and if you take, how many of you have taken measure theory? OK, so if you've taken measure theory, then a lot of that is to resolve issues like this as to what events can you assign a probability to. OK, so what we want to do is we want to calculate probabilities of various things. So in particular, so it was yeah, thank you. It was doing so well earlier today. So let's say we have x and y are independent random variables. So in a probability class, you would do a lot more on what does it mean to be independent. I'm going to just assume we are all comfortable with a notion like this. Knowledge of one gives you no information about knowledge of the other. So if you have two die that are glued, well, if you roll one, you pretty much know what the other die is going to be. OK? So we want to look at a new variable, z, is x plus y. And the question is, if I know the density functions of x and y, what should the density function of z be? Instead of looking at x plus y, I could also look at x times y. And if you look at x times y, the answer we get will actually look very similar to the gamma function in places. And so the dx over x that we saw in the gamma functions will actually surface here. I'm not going to do something like that. I'm going to just leave that as something for you to ponder. So let's calculate what is the density function of z. So there's a lot of ways to do this. I am trying to do this in as fast a way as possible. If I'm correct, only one of you has taken probability. Is that correct? Only one. Arjun, have you taken probability? No. OK. So I'm going to try to do this a little fast. So we let big F of x be the probability that the random variable, oops, this should be at the point x, is at most little x. This is called the cumulative distribution function. <coughs> this is one of the few times we actually have good notation. You know, little f for the density, big F for the cumulative distribution function. You should be thinking integration. And this is actually just the integration from negative infinity to x. So this is just the integral from minus infinity to x of little fx. Now I have to use a different variable, so I'll use t dt. 
And so I want to calculate what is the probability density function. Well, if I know the cumulative distribution function, how do I get the density from the cumulative distribution function? You just take the derivative. So let's calculate the cumulative distribution function of z. So we'll say, you know, f of z of little z will be the probability that z is less than or equal to little z. And so I'll try to put to make it clear that this is a z. So this is the same as the probability that x plus y is less than or equal to little z. And so now we can try to figure out exactly what this would be. I swear I beta tested this before class started. All right. So we get fz of z. So now let's think, what does it mean for the probability of x plus y to be a little bit less than z? Well, I can take any value for x. So we're going to integrate x goes from minus infinity to infinity. And now, what's the largest y can get up to? z minus x. And then I'll have the probability I chose x, the probability I chose y, dy, dx. OK, so we can do the y integration. And we will get the integral x goes from minus infinity to infinity, fx of x. And now I will get big F y, its cumulative distribution function, at z minus x. And then I have to subtract off the cumulative distribution function at negative infinity. What's the probability y is at most negative infinity? Zero. zero. So I, I, I mean, I'll write zero for the people at home who are watching this later. OK. Now I want to differentiate. What do I do? How do I differentiate this? I pass the derivative through, right? You know, I at least think about is this justified as I'm doing this, but I absolutely pass the derivative through the integration and hit this. It's really worth pondering what goes on. At the end of the day, do we need an explicit closed form expression for the cumulative distribution function? No, we integrate it and then immediately differentiate it. This is extremely important because integration is hard. Right? Differentiation is easy. If I try, I can't give you a derivative you know, using elementary functions and combinations that you can't solve. But oh, I can write down integrals you can't do. In fact, one of the best ones is the Gaussian. There's no closed form expression for the integral of the Gaussian. So it's extremely important that when we're doing stuff like this, we are not in a position where we have to have a closed form expression of these antiderivatives. So because these functions are non-negative, because they integrate to 1, everything can be justified. And you get that the density function of z is now the integral x goes from minus infinity to infinity of fx of x. And now we take the derivative of this with respect to z. So we'll get fy at z minus x. And now what's the derivative of z minus x with respect to z? It's just 1. And here is the explicit form of the density for z if z is x plus y and they're independent. Does this remind you of anything? It's the convolution. So fz is fx star fy. Now, I mentioned earlier in the semester that if you have convolution, f star g is the same as g star f, that convolution is commutative. In this special case, when they're independent random variables, can you give me a quick one-line proof why it must be commutative? It can be x plus y. Yeah, x plus y is the same as y plus x. As x plus y equals y plus x, this implies that f of z is f of y star f of x. Now, convolution being commutative holds in greater generality than this. But here's a nice proof because you're adding independent random variables and the order doesn't matter. As a nice exercise, write down what the density would be for x times y. 
and you will see something very similar to the dx over x we have from the gamma distribution. I am not going to go through too much details about some of the other stuff. You can prove as an exercise that it's associative. If you want to now look at what would it be if you added three random variables, say x1, x2, x3, what would it be? It would be the convolution of all three of them. And so the quick way to prove this is by groupings. So say you have x1 through xn are independent. Let's let z be x1 plus x2 plus xn. And now we know f of z is f of x1 convolved with f of x2 plus xn. But by induction, because this is smaller, we know that this is the convolution of each one. And so we get f of x1 convolved all the way to f of xn. So this really shows you the power of convolution. OK. Now, unfortunately, when you do convolution, you have to do integration. And integration is hard. So this is where the Fourier transform comes in and saves the day. The Fourier transform of a convolution is the product of the Fourier transforms. I can multiply. I'm much, much better at multiplying than I am at integrating. And so the idea is when we're going to do an analysis, we want to figure out what is the density of a sum of independent random variables. Well, what we'll do is we'll take the Fourier transform, and that will convert the convolution to a product. We'll analyze this, and then this is the hard stuff which requires complex analysis. And then we'll invert at the end of the day. And that final inversion step is the one that causes enormous trouble. But the main idea is we want to understand what happens as you add more and more independent random variables. And the central limit theorem says that if these random variables are nice, you know, if they're, say, independent, identically distributed, if they have finite moments, so they don't need anything as strong as that, then the sum will converge to being normally distributed. And so we'll see why that's true. We've seen the normal <coughs> in a lot of places. So let's look at the Fourier transform of a convolution. So Fourier transform of a convolution. OK. So we often use hat to denote Fourier transform. Sometimes we use a fancy f. You know, it's sometimes a function of, well, if I have a you know, really large thing, to write a hat over everything gets very, very bad. So sometimes we'll just use an f. So let's say we have um, you know, f of z is f of x convolved with f of y. And we want to calculate the Fourier transform of f of z. And we'll do this at some point. Um, we'll do it at the point c, because c is a fun thing to draw. As an aside, have you seen probably the worst symbol to pass? the complex conjugate of capital C divided by C. So this is one of the nightmare symbols to look at. All right, let's just go by the definition. What is this? This is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of my density function fz of z, and then e to the negative 2 pi i z c d, z. Is it confusing to have a z here? Would you rather me change it to a t? Let's change it to a t. Well, we'll uh, I'll, I'll keep it as a z. All right. So the next line, we now put in, what is this? Well, it's a convolution, so it's the integral x goes from minus infinity to infinity, fx of x 
Fy of z minus x e to the negative 2 pi i z c d x dz. Okay. Which integration do you want to do first? dz. So if I look at this, for fixed value of x, I can shift z, right? So what would I want to shift z by? So I replace z with z plus x. So here this becomes, so you're going to just make sure we don't make any mistakes as we go through and do the substitution. So we'll have now the integral, oh, this is z. x goes from minus infinity to infinity. We have fx of x. So what I'll do here is I'll take a z minus x and I'll add an x. So I've got a z minus x here. So now I have a z, I have a plus x. So I'll have an e to the negative 2 pi i xc. And then I have the integral z goes from minus infinity to infinity of f y of z minus x e to the negative 2 pi i z minus x c dz and then dx. And now I can replace z minus x with t and this is just going to be the Fourier transform of y evaluated at the point c. So this is just the Fourier transform of f of y evaluated at c. And then this over here is just the Fourier transform of f of x evaluated at c. And so this shows the Fourier transform of the convolution is the product of the Fourier transforms. And in a stroke of good luck or foresight or pre-planning, depending on how you view me, this was left on the board and we started over here. So now we have a thing about the sum. The same argument applies if instead we look at Fourier transforms. So what we would just show here is that that would now be the Fourier transform of this. And then we just pass the Fourier transforms down. It's nice to be at the blackboard. So the Fourier transform of a convolution is the product of the Fourier transforms. And if all of these variables, I'm oh sorry, instead of now being stars, sorry, this is now just multiplication. That's the only change. Convolutions become multiplications. So how many of you have taken a differential equations class? So you might have seen like using Fourier transforms or using the Laplace transform to solve differential equations. You take this transform, convert it to something else, solve it, and then invert. And it's the inversion step that's the hard one. And you often have tables of inversions. And the real problem is always, do you have a unique inverse? If I take the Fourier transform, well, that's well defined in terms of what it goes to. But if at the end of the day I have a Fourier transform and I say, what's the inverse? Which things go to that? Maybe multiple things go to that. And when I want to invert, I might have a multiplicity. We saw this when we looked at the function e to the negative 1 over x squared if x is not 0 and 0 if x is 0. This has all Taylor coefficients 0. So I can just add this to any Taylor series and I don't change anything. And it's because of stuff like this that results in probability analysis are so challenging. OK. Any questions on what we've done up till now? So we've talked about densities, cumulative distribution functions. We've talked about sums of independent random variables. We've seen that the formula for the density of the sum is the convolution. We've shown that the Fourier transform of the convolution is the product of the Fourier transforms. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at something called the moment generating function. This is another example of really good nomenclature. What do you think the moment generating function gives you? Or if you want, what do you think it generates for you? So there's a lot of different generating functions you can look at. How many of you have never seen a generating function before? What exactly is a generating function? Like, have you seen the generating function for the Fibonacci's? 
so yeah, sorry, if I go a little bit too far, I lose things. Uh, let, let's just do the generating function for the Fibonacci's. So it looks like magic at first. And so, yeah. So let's say f1 equals 1. Let's say f0 equals 0. Let's say fn plus 1 is fn plus fn minus 1. So what I want to do is I want to find a formula for the nth Fibonacci number. Now, if I want to just calculate them, it's trivial. I just have to keep doing addition. But if I want to jump to the 20 billionth Fibonacci number, it's time consuming. There is an explicit <coughs> closed form expression for the nth Fibonacci number. It's one of my favorite formulas in mathematics. It's Binet's formula. There's lots of ways to prove it. You can prove it using linear algebra. But one of my favorite ways is through generating functions. And at first, it looks like this is a foolish way to proceed. We're going to define a function g of x to be the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of fn x to the n. OK, so I don't know what the Fibonacci numbers are, so I'm going to form a function that has these as its coefficients. OK. So the only reason that this can work is that somehow, because we know this recursion, we actually know everything about the Fibonacci numbers. We just don't know that we know. It'll allow us to get a closed form expression for g. And once we have a closed form expression for g, then we can deduce things about the fn's. This should be somewhat similar in spirit to what we've seen for the Riemann zeta function. When we build this up as a product of primes, we then have this global object. We want to understand that global object, and then that will give us information back about the individual objects. So this is one of the reasons why I want to do this in complex analysis. This is this local to global principle. All right, so let's look at what's going on. So g of x, well, we know the first term is just 0. And then you know we have f1, which will just be x. And then we have a sum, n goes from 2 to infinity of fn xn. And this is where it always gets annoying because you play these games with the indices. And if you've taken differential equations and done series expansions, it's ripe for making a small mistake. So this is now the sum of fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2 x to the n, and it goes from 2 to infinity. So we get g of x is x plus the sum n goes from 2 to infinity of fn minus 1 x to the n plus the sum n goes from 2 to infinity of fn minus 2 x to the n. I have an f sub n minus 1 here. How many x's do I want? I have an extra x. So let's pull out an x. So you get g of x is x plus x times the sum n goes from 2 to infinity of fn minus 1 xn minus 1. And here I'll pull out an x squared. The sum n goes from 2 to infinity of fn minus 2 x to the n minus 2. Well, if I look at what's going on here, as, two, as n goes from 2 to infinity, this goes from f1, f2, f3, f4. The only term I miss is f0. Well, f0 is 0, so this is just g of x. Over here, if I look at this term, oh, I even started 0, so it's g of x. Let's see if it turns this in. Almost turned. Thank you. So what I get now is I get a relation for g of x. So I have g of x on the left-hand side, and I have weighted combinations of g of x on the right-hand side. So we have g of x is x plus x g of x plus x squared g of x. So 1 minus x minus x squared g of x equals x. So g of x equals x over 1 minus x minus x squared. And you might notice that this is very similar to the recurrence relation you get for the Fibonacci's, the characteristic polynomial. The difference is instead of getting the roots of that characteristic polynomial, we're going to get the reciprocals because of the way things are aligned, I think. So now the question is, how do we expand this? 
one way we could try to explain this is to use the geometric series. And we could write this as x over 1 minus x plus x squared. So it's a natural thing to try, but this is an algebraic nightmare. And the reason is when you expand this, you'll then get x plus x squared to different powers. So if you want to find what gives you an x to the fifth, oh yeah, I can see some, oh dear lord, you know, this would be you know, the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of x plus x squared to the n. Well, I can pull out an x, and it would be you know, x to the n, 1 plus x to the n. So if I want to figure out what is the coefficient of x to the 5, there's a lot of different things that can give me an x to the 5. So we do not want to go like this. So the way you do this is you go back to calculus, and it's usually considered the most hated of all integration techniques. Partial fractions, right? If there's anybody here who does not put uh, partial fractions at the top of the list of the techniques of integration they don't like, was it at least second? Was it at least competitive? OK. This is the one that students normally hate the most. Let's factor the denominator as x over 1 minus alpha x and 1 minus beta x. You will factor. And now by using partial fractions, you know, we'll have an x. And so we'll get um, x times a over 1 minus alpha x plus b 1 minus beta x. And you can just figure out what a and b are in terms of alpha and beta. And now you can use the geometric series formula. And now you'll get that g of x is going to be a sum n goes from 0 to infinity. Um, and I'll get you know, a alpha to the n plus b beta to the n x to the n plus 1. And now you can just match, and those will be your Fibonacci's. So this will give you an explicit formula. So when the dust settles, you'll get fn is 1 over square root of 5, 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the n, minus 1 over square root of 5, 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the n. What I love is the Fibonacci's are integers. And this does not look like an integer. I think I usually make a joke about you know, if there's a police lineup and some number has beaten you up, and you've got a couple of candidates and you are asked you know, to identify which was it. This does not look like an integer. You've got divisions by two. You've got square roots. So as a nice exercise, what can you replace the twos and the five with and keep it as an integer? You know, if you take something of this functional form, when will you always get back an integer? But this shows you the power of generating functions. If you have a relation, if you have some information, you can build up this function. And if you understand globally what it's doing, you can then actually go backwards and get some local information. So generating functions is one of the big techniques we have. Yes? So which is g of x the generating function? So g of x is the generating function of the Fibonacci's. Okay, and why is it called the generating function? Like, what, what's, the, what's the meaning of the term generating function? But basically, it, it just generates the coefficient. It generates the Fibonacci numbers. Those are the coefficients. Okay. And so by understanding g of x, we can understand the fn's. Okay. There's a lot of different types of generating functions we can look at. We're going to look now at the moment generating function. And so you can look at first the generating function, then you can look at the moment generating function. I'm probably going to skip doing just the generating function for probability just to save time, because this is not a probability class. And I will skip straight to the moment generating function. The moment generating function, Sally, does not always exist, but a really close cousin of it, the characteristic function, always exists. We talked, it's just replacing t with it, which then justifies why we can do this in a complex analysis class, because we're using complex variables. So now we'll do moment generating functions. So we will define the moment generating function of a random variable to be the expected value of e t x. And this means it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e t x and then the density dx. OK. 
I'd like to do this integral. Any thoughts as to how we can do this integral? And we call it the moment, so the nth moment is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the n fx of x dx. And the hope is, if you understand the moments, you understand the distribution. That's not always the case. There are two different probability distributions that have the same sequence of integer moments, but are not the same. They also have the same half integer moments, but other than that, they differ. So the question is, any thoughts as to how I should evaluate this integral? What could I do? I want to somehow get an x to the n. Any thoughts as to what I could do to this to get an x to the n? So if I take the derivative with respect to t, I will get an x to the n. And then what should I set t equal to? So I then set t equal to 0. So what this is telling us is actually derivatives of this function will give us the moments. So if I take the derivative of this with respect to t, and I assume I can pass the differentiation inside the integration, then when I have e to the tx, I'll just get the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x e to the tx times my density. And more generally, if I take n derivatives, I'll get the integral of x to the n e to the tx fx of x dx. And so then if I set it equal to 0, I get the nth moment. So in some sense, the Taylor series of the moment generating function should be the moments. Another way to see this is to formally expand the exponential. So the moment generating function of t is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity of t to the n, x to the n, over n factorial times my density, dx. Right? OK. So now that I have this, integral of a sum is, of course, the sum of the integrals. I can pull out the n factor. So you, as long as my convergence is nice, this can be justified. So I'll have a sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, 1 over n factorial, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the n times my density, dx, and then t to the n. And so this will be the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of 1 over n factorial. Here's my moment, and here's my t to the n. So you can see that it has earned the name moment generating function. So if we can do this integration, we're in great shape. Now the problem is we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity. No matter what, if t is positive or negative, there's a choice for x that will make e to the tx have a positive value, in fact, a very large value, as x either goes to plus infinity or minus infinity. So the only way this integration is going to exist is if my function f has rapid decay. In fact, it has to decay faster than exponential. Now, if my density has finite support, if it maybe lives between minus 1 and 1, not a big deal. If I have something like a Gaussian, not a big deal. But the big problem with the moment generating function is it doesn't always exist. And so this is why people look at what's called the characteristic function instead. And so the characteristic function is very similar to the moment generating function. The only difference is we replace t with an it. <coughs> so the characteristic function So it will be phi x of t is the moment generating function at i t. So this will be the expected value of e to the i t x. So this is then the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i tx 
times my density function. What does this integral equal? It's like the Fourier transform. So I would want a minus 2 pi. So if I let um, u equal, I'm sorry, if I let t equal minus 2 pi u, then this is now just an e to the i u x, e to the negative 2 pi i u x. So this should become the Fourier transform of negative t over 2 pi. And you can begin to see why people hate all the different normalizations of the Fourier transform. You know, where do we have the 2 pi or not? And so a lot of times people will define the Fourier transform, especially when you're working at stuff like this, not to have the 2 pi. Or they might define the characteristic function to just put in the 2 pi. It's not a huge deal one way or the other. OK? Any questions so far? All right, so we're trying to get all the preliminaries we need for the proof of the central limit theorem. All right, so we've got the moment jutting function. Let's look at the moment jutting function of the sum of two independent random variables. So this would be the expected value of e to the t x plus y. So you know if we let z as before be x plus y, this is then the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the t z times my density function for z dz. Well, if we're assuming they're independent, what do I know about my density function? It's the convolution. So this should be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the tz. And I'll have the integral x goes from minus infinity to infinity, fx of x, fy of z minus x, dx, dz. Boy, this looks very similar to what we've done before. We write z as z minus x plus x. And when we go through all the calculations, when the dust settles at the end of the day, we will just get that the moment generating function of the sum is the sum of the moment generating functions. So the moment generating function of x plus y, if they're independent, is just equal to the moment generating function of x times the moment generating function of y. So it just falls from the same algebra we've done again and again and again. You know, I'm not assigning you that many problems on this. I want you to just basically see where complex goes. Strongly urge you, if you want to, to go through and do the calculation. What about for the characteristic functions? Is this true? Yeah, do a search and replace, right? Take all the t's and put in an it. So this is also true for characteristic functions. The next thing we want is what if we tried to calculate the moment generating function of ax plus b? Well, this is going to be the expected value of e to the a x plus b times t. And if you think about what's going on, this is the expected value of e to the a x t e to the b t. But the expectation is with respect to x. So you can write it out explicitly. You know, you're integrating x goes from minus infinity to infinity. This is just a constant. What can I do with a constant? I can pull it out. So this is just e to the bt. And now I have the expected value of e to the, I'm going to write this as x at. And what does this equal? It's the moment generating function at at. So we get the moment generating function of ax plus b is just e to the bt, the moment generating function of x at at. So things transform very nicely. We understand what goes on with the product, as with the sum, the sum becomes a product, and we understand what happens with a nice linear transformation. 
What you can then do is you can start trying to calculate moment generating functions of a lot of the common probability distributions. You could also try to calculate the characteristic functions of a lot of these probability distributions. And this is where some of the techniques from complex analysis are useful. If you're doing the calculus for a characteristic function, you're integrating against either the i, t, x. And so some of the integrals in the early parts of the book, where they say, you know, calculate this integral. If you go back and look carefully, you'll see that there are terms that look like an e to the i, t, or an e to the i, t, x, something like that. They're really having you calculate Fourier transforms. They just weren't using the words Fourier transforms. So you can compute a lot of these very easily. And now the question becomes, um, can we talk about what a sum of independent random variables is going to converge to? And this is the celebrated central limit theorem. So we will at least be able to get to the statement today and you know, start the analysis. But you know, to some extent, I'm, I'm trying to see, can I do more fundamental theorems in this class than in any other class you've taken? We've done the fundamental theorem of algebra. We've at least talked about the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. We're now doing the central limit theorem. They don't technically call it the fundamental theorem of probability, but if you know, if you were to choose one, it would be that. We've you know, at least mentioned the fundamental theorem of calculus a few times. Uh, the fundamental theorem of linear algebra is pretentious and overrated and does not really deserve in my mind the name fundamental, so I'm not going to let that count. So central limit theorem. So the first is just some notation. So the mean, we often write mu or the expected value of x. And it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x times the density dx. So think of the average value. The next is the variance. And we write that as sigma squared. And it's the expected value of x minus its mean squared. So this is a measure of how spread out you are. And this is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x minus mu squared f of x dx. Now these integrals may not always exist. So just because I can write these integrals down doesn't mean that the integrals are well behaved. And so, for instance, if we take f of x to be the Cauchy distribution, 1 over pi 1 plus x squared, you can argue as to whether or not it has a mean. You know, it's at least symmetric, so if you do the integration in a symmetric way, it's zero, but you don't have to integrate symmetrically. It clearly doesn't have a variance, because if I try to integrate x squared over 1 plus x squared, my integrand is basically converging to 1 over pi. So not every distribution has a finite mean and a finite variance. The variance measures how spread out something is. Later in the semester, we're going to prove the uncertainty principle from physics. So you know, I have to put this in quotes. What we will do is we will show that you can consider, if I give you a nice function f, in physics, we often use the modulus of f squared as the probability. So if I give you a function f such that the modulus of f squared integrates to 1, it turns out that so, so does the integral of the modulus of f hat squared. And there's a result that if you look at this, the variance of modulus f squared times the variance of modulus f hat squared has to be at least a certain size. And that certain size depends on 2 pi. The physics interpretation then is that somehow this corresponds to position and the Fourier transform corresponds to momentum. That's outside my pay grade. You have to go to one of the physics professors for that. But it's really a statement about a function and its Fourier transform. You cannot simultaneously localize both a function and its Fourier transform. If you think back to what we did for the Gaussian, you know, we basically had, if I had like e to the negative nx squared, when I took the Fourier transform, I got something like e to the negative x squared over n. So as n gets very, very large, this is localized tightly about 0. You know, once x is of size like 1 over square root of n, you've already dropped off to 1 over e. If x is as large as you know, 1 over n to the quarter, this is incredibly small. But over here, x can get as <coughs> large as square root of n and still have this have sizable probability. So this is a great example of the duality, that the closer we know on this side, the less we know on this side, and vice versa. And that's the pull that we get with 
um, the uncertainty principle. So we're going to be seeing these concepts of variance again later. All right, the higher moments, um, it turns out that there's a convenient way of calculating this after doing some algebra. It turns out it's the same as the expected value of x squared minus the square of the expected value. If you haven't seen probability before, it's nice to just do this calculation. The reason we write this as sigma squared is because what do you think we care about for those who haven't seen probability? Sigma. Yeah, sigma is the thing we care about. Sigma and mu have the same units. So when I'm looking at mu, think of x's in meters. This is going to be my average in meters. So if I want to know, on average, how tall are people? Oh, people are people about 1.4 meters, plus or minus something in meters squared. Well, when you're taking an error in meters squared, you're thinking areas. That, when I'm trying to compare people's heights, I shouldn't be getting into areas. The square root of the variance is the one that measures the fluctuations. And so the setup for the central limit theorem, let's say x1 through xn are independent identically distributed, random variables with mean mu variance sigma squared. And let's assume the moment generating function converges in a neighborhood of t equals 0. So we'll assume that the moment generating functions exist in a neighborhood of t equals 0. Then if I look at x1 plus x n, how large do I expect that sum to be? About n times mean. So I would subtract off n times the mean so that this is now of size, expected to be of size 0. And then something that's a little bit harder, I'm not going to go into this. This is a result from probability. If you have a sum of independent random variables, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. So each of these has variance sigma squared. So the variance of the whole sum is also going to be n times sigma squared. So I want to divide by sigma square root of n. And now this variable will have mean 0 variance 1. So we typically denote this by z. This is mean 0 variance 1. And this converges to being to the standard normal. OK? So we've got about a minute and a half left. All right, not quite enough time to prove the central limit there. But it's enough time to start to see what's going on. We have a sum over here. We can understand the sum in terms of convolutions. We can understand the moment generating function of a sum as the product of the moment generating functions. We had a result about, well, if I understand the moment generating function of x, I understand the moment generating function of ax plus b. So I can figure out, ah, what's going on with these pieces, what's going on with these pieces, how it changes everything. And so then on. Monday's class, we will go through and start talking about this. Now, we still have class on Wednesday. That's was, there's no class on Wednesday. All right, there's no class on Wednesday. So we've got to get the central limit theorem done before Thanksgiving. All right. So I will try to get it done on uh, Monday's class. If not, we will then you know, quickly finish that off after um, Thanksgiving break. And then very shortly, we will have done all of the stuff that you will need for the second midterm. There will still be you know, one section which just says, you know, choose one of the special topics. We haven't done fractals yet. We haven't done you know, various other things. If you want to wait so that you can talk about those things as well, you're welcome to it. But you should be able to take the test uh, basically after Thanksgiving, if you wish.